All right, final 10, so 51. 51 is a great trap question because there's two traps on it. So when you draw oxalate, you're gonna have a carbon-carbon single bond, double bond to an oxygen, single bond to an oxygen, double bond to an oxygen, single bond to an oxygen. So most people will look at this and see four different bonds and then go, oh wait, but these two are the same and these two are the same and then lean to B. But what they're missing then is that this one is actually the same as this one because they're forgetting about the resonance structures. So this is not static, or this is a picture of static, but in real life molecules not like that. And this bond is actually the same as this. We're just seeing the electrons kind of shift between the two. So it turns out that these two are the same, these two are the same, these two are the same, and these two are the same. So really they're all the same, and we only have one. Okay, this question uh, I got a little thrown off by. So when I first read A, I wasn't really sure about it, and I kind of threw it out. And then what happened is I went through the rest and found them all to be incorrect, and then came back and said, well, I know the least about A, so I'm going to go with that. So in part B, it says we have to have a different number of nodes than every other molecular orbital. So by nodes, they mean a point where the wave function is zero. So S orbitals uh, have zero nodes, at least angularly. Uh, here we have a node where there's nothing there. In a D orbital, we have two nodes. But all, all D orbitals have two nodes. All P orbitals have one, one node. So, so I just saw this and thought, you know what, there's no rule that kind of correlates that on an atomic scale. And therefore, I expect the same thing for the molecular scale. Uh, so I went with that being incorrect, uh, and that worked out pretty well for me. All right, and then C, it says the number of molecular orbitals is half the number of atomic orbitals. That's incorrect. Whenever you take like a 2s orbital and a 3s orbital and you combine them into molecular orbitals, you end up with the same number of each. Okay, right, you have a couple little guidelines for this, but basically this is going to decrease in energy uh, by more than this will increase, I'm sorry, by less than this will increase in energy. Uh, but you end up taking two atomic orbitals and combining them into two molecular orbitals. So you should have the same number for both. And then the last one is obviously wrong. So this is when I started to go, oh, maybe I need to go back and revisit it. So the lowest energy molecular orbital, this one is your bonding orbital. This says it's anti-bonding. Uh, no, this is the one where the electrons are localized between the nuclei. This is the one where the electrons are far away from the nuclei, and really you're getting no stabilization and a destabilizing effect because of your nuclei being close together. So D is definitely wrong. So at that point I went back and said, you know, I'm not 100% confident in B, but I don't know what's going on in A, I'm gonna pick it, and then it ended up working out. So I think that's intended to be one where you eliminate B, C, and D. Uh, 53, this is a good question. Um, the answers are a little different than what I would expect, so NF3. We have our lone pair. I'm not going to draw all the lone pairs on the fluorines. And PF3 has the exact same structure. And it tells us that the bond angle is a little bit um, closer together for the nitrogen than for the phosphorus. So, so these bonds are a little bit close, or, I'm sorry, closer here, and these are a little bit further apart in angle. Okay, so, so that's not because of electronegativity. What's happening there is that because the phosphorus is a larger atom, uh, we have a greater separation between these pairs of electrons, and therefore we don't see as great a disparity in repulsion between these two and these two. All right. So um, C obviously is incorrect, both of them have unpaired electrons, and then D obviously is incorrect because we're not an ionic compound. But the actual correct answer, A, the reason why that's correct, is what that's saying is, is that here on the nitrogen, if we had just P orbital overlap, we would experience 90 degree bond angles. So the, the further we deviate from that, the more the S orbital is involved in that bonding and that hybridization. And therefore, since the nitrogen here has a further deviation from 90 degrees, it has more 2S orbital participation than 3S. Okay. Uh, 54 is kind of an interesting one. So the idea here is that for this carbon here with the double bond to the carbon, and double bond to the carbon. So when we're looking at a double bond and we have this pi bonding, we have the sigma overlap, but we have to have a pi overlap as well. And there's two ways for that to occur, kind of in the y direction or in the z direction. So I don't have a good way to draw z, but I'm going to try and draw in front and behind to the carbon here. So we have this kind of pi bonding here. Sorry, that should go all the way out to the carbon there. Um, but we have this kind of z direction and this y direction. And so when we look at the second carbon here, in this one, we're going to have the hydrogens coming off at the opposite end because we need that uh, pure build uh, from the from this carbon to be able to be free for this. And in this one, the two hydrogens are going to go up in the Y and down 
in the y direction. So what we have here is we have kind of, so we have the hydrogens on one side that are oriented, uh, what do we have here, in the z direction, so kind of like this, and in this one they're oriented more like this direction. Okay, so we have a linear central carbon atom in two perpendicular planes, B is our corrections. Okay, 55 here, we're looking at chirality. This one's a pretty tricky one. You wanna start with A. You should notice this carbon atom, obviously. So chiral would be that we have four different things attached to this particular thing. So here we have a chlorine attached, a hydrogen that we haven't drawn in, and then we have the two carbons in each direction. But when you follow this through clockwise or counterclockwise, you find that it's 100% identical in both directions all the way around the molecule. So what that means is, is there's no difference between this side and this side, and therefore this is not a chiral molecule. Now, if you get to C and D, all of a sudden, you know, you start here and you go, okay, well this one has the same thing on both sides. But if you start here, this one, you get to a carbon with a chlorine and a carbon with two hydrogens. So this one does have a differentiation, as does this one. The difference is, is that because the entire molecule is 100% symmetrical, not 100% symmetrical, but it has this line of symmetry about these two uh, chiral centers, this is what's called a meso compound. And what that basically means is that whatever chiral activity you're getting from this is going to be undone by this. Here's your R, here's your S, or here's your, here's your R, here's your S. Uh, but they're both going to have the same effect on polarization of light. This one is also a meso compound. And so you were probably drawn to be in the first place and that is your correct choice because this uh, atom right there is chiral. You'll experience differences going around based on that stereochemistry. So B was the best choice for that. 56, I'm not 100% sure of. Um, so, so when I saw this, I saw this had hydrogen bonding. This CHO is, a, is an aldehyde. So we have a hydroxyl group here. So we have hydrogen bonding for both here and here. So when we're doing a separation, you would think that that would come into play the most. And so our first choice, diethyl ether, which is a slightly polar, uh, and then water, which has hydrogen bonding. Since both have hydrogen bonding, you expect both to be drawn to the water, but there's polarity of diethyl ether. And these do have some nonpolar components. So maybe there's some of both, but it's not gonna separate them well. However, in the next three choices we have, weak acid, strong base, and then and the strong acid. So then we kind of look, okay, well, what's going on acid base wise? So from the acid base perspective here, we have a carboxylic acid or carboxyl group here. So, so having a base present is going to deprotonate this, which will ionize it, which will draw a lot more into the aqueous solution because of that charge. Okay, and diethyl ether is gonna to struggle to support something with the charge. So what I did here is I said, okay, well, weak base or strong base, which one of those is the best for this? And I figured, well, it's possible that this hydrogen could be deprotonated. That would give us a negative charge localized on here, except it can delocalize that charge because of the aromaticity of the benzene. And so therefore I said, well, I'm gonna go with the weak base, which I know will deprotonate this easily, but maybe won't deprotonate this, and that'll give me a better separation between the two. And it'll be in that end up working out. Okay, 57 is a really challenging question. So, so first of all, when we're looking at this E-butuene, e uh, I don't know why I didn't put the IUPAC naming on there. One of the things you have to know, first of all, to be able to even kind of approach this question, is that when this has an addition reaction with a halogen, what's going to happen is this double bond is going to be used to form an interaction with the bromine, one of the bromines. And that's going to then break off and a bromide is going to be free somewhere else going to form a bond to both of these rather than form a carbocation. Okay, that gives a positive charge to the bromine, and then the bromide is going to swing around here and either form a bond here or form a bond here. Okay, and then that's, it forms a bond here, uh, then this bond breaks and the bromine ends up here. But basically the point is we're getting bromines kind of on 180 degrees from one another, which is going to affect the stereochemistry. Okay. So when we're done, we're going to end up with the stereochemistry that we started with influencing our final answer. So the way I ended up doing the problem was I finally, I couldn't figure it out in my head, I just had to draw it. So what I did was I kind of took this, I said, all right, I'm going to rotate this a little bit so it's easy for me to see. And I just put a bromine up and a bromine down. 
bromine down and the CH3 up. Okay. I'm going to do the same thing over here with what's going to happen here. Uh, so I have CH3 uh, like this. assume the hydrogens were in the back of the molecule. And then I went through and I assigned R and S to each of these. So for this one here, I ended up with R and R. And then for this one here, I ended up with one R and one S. So what is the relationship between the products? Well, if we have an RR and an RS, we do not, we're not enantiomers. Okay. Um, but rather we're different in three-dimensional space, but not in antimers, and that qualifies as diastereum. So that one was pretty hard. I don't know. I even flipped around for a little bit before I ended up with an answer, but it ended up being right. So um, Here we're looking at the Fischer esterification reaction. The key thing for the acid catalyst there is we're taking the carbonyl, or I'm sorry, carboxyl group here. And what's happening is first thing that happens is the H plus from the acid forms a bond with this, which makes this. We have our carbon to an OH. So an OH. And we can form a double bond or we can have the carbocation. We're really going to kind of have resonance between those. But I'm going to put the carbocation form here to kind of make the emphasis. So these electrons can come down, form a double bond, come back. These electrons can form a double bond, come back. But what we've done is we've increased the reactivity of this carbon center. So the answer that matches that is that it converts the propanoic acid to a more reactive electrophile because this carbon here has a positive charge, it's going to go out seeking other electron density negative charge, and that's when the ethanol can come in and form the bond with it because of that increase in electrophilicity. Okay, 59 here. Um, it's talking about isoelectric point of pH for, for different um, proteins, and we're looking at doing substitutions. So all I did for this was look and say, okay, this is a mostly neutral, acidic, or basic thing. So oh, a hydroxyl group could be acidic, it could be basic, but for the most part neutral. And an amine group is basic. So I said, all right, well, that's a big change. So unless I get an acid to a base, uh, here I've got an amide, uh, which is basic, and then I've got a thiol group, and that's also basic because of the lone pairs on sulfur. Here I've got neutral, can't really do anything to neutral, uh, and then here I've got neutral to neutral. So then I went back and just said, well, that's easy, that's going to be A. Okay, and on 60 here, this is a really challenging question. So let's start with the simplest one to eliminate, and that's C. So when we undergo hydrolysis, even when it's acid catalyzed, what's going to happen is, is we're going to come in and we're going to cleave this bond we're going to end up with a hydroxyl group on both spots. So the water, the hydrogen on one part of the water, and the hydroxyl part of the water are going to end up here and here. So this oxygen here takes this hydrogen, this carbon attaches to this uh, hydroxyl group. Okay? So we're looking for differences between the two. For instance, on this one, uh, nice and simple here, we have a methyl group here. We don't have a methyl group anywhere on here. This is going to have a CH3, but it's going to have the OH attached to it. So we know that those are going to be different products, and therefore that's not the answer. Okay. At that point, it's really hard to kind of distinguish this. You have to do it by looking at stereochemistry and whether things are in an axial or equatorial position around the thing. So I would go to A next, and then lactose is something you might have heard of from milk, and you might know that that turns into galactose and glucose. And so you know that this produces two different sugars. And if you go around the molecule, like starting at the oxygen in the brain, you know, we have this attachment to a, a methanol group and then hydroxyls all the way around, right? And here we have the oxygen to the methanol group and then hydroxyls all the way around. But we know that we produce two different sugars. And so what you can do is you can look at the fact that this is equatorial up, this is equatorial down, and therefore maybe there's a difference in stereochemistry, which is the case. So this ends up not being the case. So now we're down to B and D. And at that point, if you just give it a guess, you might, you might be okay. Um, but here you again have to look so here is your C2OH, this is equatorial up, this is axial up. 
And so that's the difference here, I think, on why those don't match. Uh, and then D is the one where everything works out nicely. You're starting at equatorial up and equatorial down, but you are inverted. And so therefore, when you uh, undergo the confirmation change, that should come out to be the same. And then D is your option.